Good afternoon. My name is Kim Stanger. I'm the head of the firm's health law group, and we would like to in, uh, welcome you to participate in our program today, our next webinar in our series of Health Law Basics. Today we're going to be talking about responding to law enforcement. We'd especially like to thank the support of the Idaho Hospital Association, who is a co-sponsor in this program, and we always appreciate being able to team up with them. This is what we're going to talk about today. You know, I get those calls sometimes from local hospitals or other entities that says, ah, oh, the police are down here. What can we do? What can we tell them? What do we, how do we handle, how do we respond to these police issues? So we're going to talk today about the privacy issues. And of course, anytime we talk about privacy and healthcare, we're going to talk about the HIPAA rules, some of the rules for mandatory disclosures when you must disclose information to the police. But most of the HIPAA exceptions allow for permissive disclosures. It's not required by HIPAA, but you're allowed to if you satisfy certain criteria. We'll also touch briefly about some situations, about how to respond to, to situations where the police may request treatment to the patient, or maybe the police requests access to your patients, either to interview them or arrest them or something like that. We're going to focus on Idaho law today, however, we represent a lot of clients outside of Idaho, too. Our firm's a large and amount firm. So for those of you who are outside Idaho, the principles we're going to talk about today really apply there also. Although I'll be referring to some specific Idaho statutes, most of your states also have very similar statutes, and so the same type of principles will apply. As far as written materials, you should have been given a copy of the PowerPoint presentations. Also, I've given you a, a copy of the OCR's HIPAA Privacy Rule Guide for Law Enforcement. It's a new document that the Office for Civil Rights generated. That's real helpful not only for your own purposes, but it's also helpful if you can provide that to your local police force so that they understand the limits and the restrictions that apply to you. I've given you a couple of client alerts that I provided, including a client alert on disclosures to law enforcement and another on responding to subpoenas, orders, and administrative demands. Uh, just a side note here, we periodically send out these client alerts to help our clients uh, respond to different issues. If you would like to receive those, there's no charge. Just shoot me a quick email and we'll make sure that you're added to our client alert list. A few preliminaries. As always, this is an overview of relevant laws. We're going to be focusing a lot on HIPAA today, which of course is a federal law, but it's possible that there may be other state laws or even local ordinances that may apply in your particular jurisdiction. So you got to be sensitive and realize that those are out there. Remember that HIPAA preempts less restrictive state laws. So if there is a law that, for example, would allow you to make disclosure, but HIPAA prohibits you from making disclosure, you got to go with HIPAA. HIPAA preempts less restrictive state laws. On the other hand, if there's a law that is more restrictive than HIPAA, so even though HIPAA would allow you to make the disclosure, if the state law is more restrictive, then you generally have to comply with that more restrictive state law. Today we're going to be focusing on disclosures to law enforcement with a few side trips, but the general uh, focus is on law enforcement. Additional rules may apply in other situations, for example, responding to certain types of subpoenas in civil litigation or agency inspections. I'm really not going to get too much into that, although a lot of the exceptions that we're going to talk about today may apply in those other situations as well. If you have questions during the program, you're welcome to submit those via the chat feature or just shoot me an email and I'll respond offline. Finally, the session will be recorded and available for download if any of you want to use this for internal training or you want to go back and listen to it again, although I can't imagine why you would want to. Um, it is available on YouTube, although I suspect that I won't get as many hits as the most recent Grumpy Cat video. All right, with that said, let's talk about the privacy issues that you have. Well, the problem here is the law enforcement, prosecutors, the police, when they show up at your facility and want this information, they may not understand HIPAA. They may not know that those regulations apply or how they apply in that situation. And quite frankly, they're not subject to HIPAA. So in a lot of ways, they really don't care about HIPAA. Their job is to catch bad guys, to get the information they need to prosecute or enforce the laws. And therefore, they're really not there to help you comply with HIPAA. They may at sometimes actually tell you things that aren't consistent with HIPAA because simply they don't understand or they don't care. 
But you are still subject to HIPAA, and therefore, just because the police show up does not mean that you are exempted from HIPAA requirements. If you fail to comply with the HIPAA requirements, hey, you can get hit up with civil penalties of anywhere from $100 per violation up to $50,000 per violation. The bad news is, if you are deemed to have acted with willful neglect, you can get hit up with mandatory fines of $10,000 to $50,000 per violation. The good news is if you don't act with willful neglect and you've otherwise correct the situation within 30 days, that's an affirmative defense. So if you've got appropriate policies and procedures in place and you've trained your people how to respond to police situations, chances are you're not going to be liable for any kind of HIPAA violation you're not going to get fined, even if there is an improper uh, disclosure, maybe because the police insist on something that they're not entitled to. The key there is to make sure that you train your people about the items we're going to talk about today. There are also criminal penalties that it can apply, but that's probably not going to apply very much in these particular situations. Those criminal penalties apply if employees or other individuals obtain or disclose protected health information without authorization. The penalties there can be anywhere from $50,000 up to $250,000 fine and up to 10 years in prison. But hopefully that would never, uh, a police situation would never invoke those. In addition, uh, if you violate HIPAA, your state attorney general can sue you for HIPAA violation, get hit up with fines of $25,000 per violation plus costs. Private individuals can also well, there is no private cause of action under HIPAA, but they may sue you for a privacy law tort. So if you disclose information improperly, chances are you're not going to get hit up with criminal fines or you're not going to get sued by the AG, but that individual whose information was disclosed might sue you for a privacy tort. And HIPAA may be viewed as essentially the standard of care, so you could be liable for resulting damages. Even if you're not worried about that, you've got to be worried about self-reporting breaches of unsecured protected health information because under HIPAA, as you know, you have an affirmative obligation to narc on yourself to the individual whose information was improperly disclosed as well as to the government. And even if you're not worried about all of that, you've got to be a little bit worried about your job because HIPAA requires covered entities to impose sanctions against members of the workforce who violate HIPAA. So let's talk about the HIPAA analysis. How do you disclose or how do you determine whether you can disclose the information to the police? Well, here's generally the HIPAA analysis. You've got to ask yourself these questions. First, does HIPAA even apply to the request? Second, does HIPAA, assuming it applies, does it allow the disclosure? Does that officer have authority to request the information? Is there a HIPAA authorization that allows you to make the disclosure? Has the patient given you an authorization to make the disclosure? Or is there an exception under HIPAA that would allow you to make the disclosure? And third, even if HIPAA allows the disclosure, should you make the disclosure? In large part, HIPAA doesn't require you to make any disclosures, but there may be another law that requires or prohibits the disclosure. Or even if you can make the disclosure, have you limited that disclosure to the minimum amount necessary under HIPAA's minimum necessary standard? We'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's talk about those. Does HIPAA even apply? Remember, HIPAA applies to covered entities and their business associates. Covered entities are health care providers who engage in certain electronic transactions. Health plans, including group health, uh, group health plans, if they're administered uh, by a third party or have more than 50 participants. But it only applies to those health care providers when they're acting in their capacity as a health care provider. So, for example, if the police just simply show up and want information about your employee and you didn't provide health care to that employee, they're not seeking health care records, they just want employment records, HIPAA is not going to apply to that. Also, if the police show up and maybe just want information because you happen to be a witness or one of your employees happens to be a witness, outside of the context or the course of scope of their providing health care services, then HIPAA probably would not apply to that. HIPAA only applies if and to the extent the information relates to the provision of health care by the health care provider. HIPAA applies to protected health information. Now, protected health information, or PHI, is pretty broad. It's any information that may reasonably be used to identify an individual relating to health, health care, or payment. It's not only their medical records, but it's also their bills, it's their name, it's their address, it's any identifiable information created or maintained by the covered entity 
even if you maintain that information that you've received from another healthcare provider, HIPAA still applies to that. And it applies to information in any form or medium, whether it's paper, electronic, oral, video, just simply the fact that the person was a patient at your particular organization, HIPAA applies to all of that stuff. HIPAA does not apply to other information, even though it may be confidential. For example, employment records, incident reports not involving patients, the other stuff that is maybe you maintain in the course of providing your business, but not related to the provision of healthcare particular individuals, HIPAA may not apply to that other information. So, next question is, okay, assuming HIPAA applies, can you disclose it? HIPAA is really relatively simple. It can be boiled down to this slide. Generally, the rule is a covered entity may not use or disclose protected health information unless that use or disclosure is for purposes of treatment, payment, or health care operations, then you don't need the patient's authorization. Now, disclosures to the police are probably not going to be for purposes of treatment, payment, or health care operations. I suppose there could be a rare instance, but this one usually isn't going to apply. HIPAA allows you to make the disclosure to the extent you have a written HIPAA-compliant authorization. So if a patient, for example, the victim of um, a crime or a victim of abuse, if she gives you an authorization that allows you to make disclosures to the police, you can certainly do that. Just make sure you limit your disclosure to the scope of that authorization. Or third, for anything else, you've got to have a HIPAA exception. Now, there are some specific exceptions under HIPAA that apply to the disclosure to law enforcement, but only if certain conditions are satisfied. So let's talk about those. First, and perhaps most importantly, HIPAA allows you to make disclosures to the extent another law requires the disclosure. But you've got to make sure that you limit that disclosure to the scope of that other law. So even though HIPAA may not require the disclosure, HIPAA says, hey, if there's a state law that requires you to disclose information to law enforcement, then you've got to disclose or you can disclose that information to law enforcement. But just make sure that you're only disclosing the information that's allowed by law and you comply with the terms of that particular statute. Now, note that this exception only applies to the extent another law uh, requires the disclosure. It does not apply if another law simply permits the disclosure. For example, in Idaho, there was a recent uh, statute that was enacted that allows healthcare providers to report to Department of Transportation or maybe law enforcement if they think that a particular person is incompetent to drive. Now, that law only allows the disclosure. It doesn't require it. Under HIPAA, that law basically is a, is a nullity. HIPAA says you can't make the disclosure unless you can fit within another exception. It would not fit within this particular exception because this exception only applies if another law requires the disclosure, not permits the disclosure. So what are some laws that require healthcare providers to make disclosures to uh, law enforcement? Well, under Idaho law, and most of your state laws will have similar laws, uh, Idaho law requires healthcare providers to report if they provide uh, treatment to uh, of any injury inflicted by means of a firearm or any injury indicating that the person may be the victim of a crime. Under the Idaho statute, you've got to report that to local law enforcement as soon as treatment permits, and that reportment shall include the name and address of the injured person, the character and extent of the person's injury, and the medical basis for making the report. That's the information that you can disclose. To the extent the police want more information that's outside of that, they would have to fit within a different HIPAA exception. Note that that applies if you are providing treatment to the uh, victim of a crime. Uh, just a side note, that raises interesting questions about statutory rape and whether or not you ever have to disclose the fact that a minor is having sex with a boyfriend or somebody else, but that is the topic for another discussion. All right, what's another law that requires disclosure? Well, all of your states will have uh, statutes that require disclosure of child abuse or neglect. In Idaho, healthcare providers have to disclose child abuse or neglect. They have to disclose if there's a reason to believe a child under age 18 has been abused, abandoned, or neglected, or observe the child being subjected to conditions which would reasonably result in abuse, abandonment, or neglect. For any of you entities who also operate a skilled nursing facility, at least in Idaho, 
uh, even though this statute says you only have to report if there's reasonable cause, a reasonable basis to believe that that's occurred, if you're operating this skilled nursing facility in Idaho, they expect you to uh, make that report even if there's an allegation and you don't think that it ever occurred, you're still obligated to, or you still better uh, go ahead and make that report. Uh, if you are working with a hospital, uh, the statute says that the medical staff members uh, should notify the person in charge of the hospital and that person or that person's designee is the one who makes the report to the government. Uh, there's a separate statute or actually HIPAA allows you to go ahead and make disclosures about abuse, neglect, or domestic violence. You, but there's limits on the ability to make those disclosures under HIPAA. Under HIPAA, you can only disclose information necessary to report abuse, neglect, or domestic violence if you've satisfied one of the criteria, if the individual or the victim agrees to the disclosure, or if and to the extent the disclosure is required by law. In Idaho, we have a law that requires those disclosures. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Or if in your particular state, the disclosure is not required by law, but it's authorized by law, then you've got some additional criteria that you have to satisfy before you can go ahead and make that disclosure. Now, even if you are allowed to make the disclosure or required to make this disclosure under your state law or under HIPAA, HIPAA says you must promptly inform the patient or the personal representative that you've made that disclosure unless you believe that informing the patient would place that patient at the risk of serious harm or if the disclosure would be made to the personal representative and you think that that personal representative is the person who's actually doing the abusing. In those situations, you don't necessarily have to make the disclosure or tell the patient that you've made the disclosure to law enforcement. In Idaho, we have a statute that requires reporting vulnerable adult abuse. This statute does not require reporting all adult abuse, just vulnerable adult abuse. Who are vulnerable adults? Under the statute, vulnerable adult is a person 18 years of age or older who is unable to protect himself from abuse, neglect, or exploitation due to physical or mental impairment, which affects the person's judgment or behavior to the extent that he lacks sufficient understanding or capacity to make or communicate or implement decisions regarding his person. So if you've got a vulnerable adult and you think that they're abused, healthcare providers have to immediately report the information to the Idaho Commission on Aging. Uh, nursing facilities have to report it to the Department of Health and Welfare. If you have reasonable cause to believe that that abuse or, or sexual assault has resulted in death or serious physical injury jeopardizing the life, health, or safety of the individual, you've got to report that to law enforcement within four hours. Now, note that this only applies, it only requires reports of vulnerable adult abuse. But remember, Idaho has that separate statute that says if you provide uh, treatment to victims of a crime, including abuse, spousal abuse, or something else, you have an affirmative obligation to make that report under that separate statute. This vulnerable adult abuse statute may not apply, but the statute we talked about earlier about making disclosures to victims of, about victims of a crime would apply. Uh, Idaho also has another statute that applies to health, mental health professionals, which include physicians, professional counselors, psychologists, social workers, and pro, social workers and professional nurses. This applies if a patient has communicated an explicit threat of imminent serious physical harm or death to clearly identified or identifiable victim and the patient has the apparent intent and ability to carry out such a threat. So if you receive word or if the patient's communicated that explicit threat, then you have an affirmative obligation to report in a timely manner to warn the victim and notify law enforcement of that report. That basically codifies that old Tarasov case. If the victim is a minor, the mental health professional must also warn the victim's custodial parent, non-custodial parent, or their legal guardian. Idaho also allow, requires you to make a report if you are the custodian of body, if you have a body, and if the circumstances surrounding death are such that it appears that that death resulted from violence, whether by homicide, suicide, or accident, or if it occurred under suspicious or unknown circumstances, presumably that would be also the result of a crime or other suspicious circumstances, or if the death is of a child or a stillborn infant and there is reasonable suspicion to believe that the death occurred without a known medical disease to account for the death. 
you've got to either notify the coroner or law enforcement. In addition, you've got to take reasonable precautions to preserve the body and bodily fluids and not disturb the scene pending investigation so CSI can show up and do their, their thing. If you fail to notify them, then that is a, a misdemeanor. If you're hiding the evidence or try to cover stuff up, that's actually a felony. All right. I get this question sometimes. Maybe you discover that a patient is, has stolen one of your prescription pads or is diverting uh, controlled substances. Are you obligated to report that? Well, under the DEA regulations, this is an Idaho specific. This actually applies to all DEA registrants. The DEA takes the position that registrants must notify the DEA field office in their area in writing of the theft or significant loss of any controlled substance within one business day of discovery of such theft or loss. And there's forms that you can go on and you fill that out. If you fail to take appropriate action to make that report, then the DEA can actually take action against your DE re-registration. For more information, you can go on to the DEA website and it gives you the information along with the form as to how you go ahead and make those reports. Those are the main laws, at least in Idaho, that require you to make disclosures to law enforcement. Uh, for sake of completeness, there are other laws that require certain disclosures of, for example, communicable diseases, certain blood tests that demonstrate uh, bodily fluid transmitted viruses, diseases. Um, certain other items, those aren't necessarily made to law enforcement, but for the sake of completeness, I wanted to throw those in there. Remember, don't forget about your own local laws or ordinances. It may be that there's another local law or ordinances that may apply, not a state law. For example, I recently learned that over in Pocatello, there's a city ordinance that requires you to report dog bites to the police. Now, that's not a state requirement, but your particular city may have a similar ordinance that requires similar reports. All right, so those are the situations where HIPAA allows you to make the report because another law requires that report. So that's the first uh, option that you might have in making disclosures to the police. Next, and perhaps most importantly, HIPAA allows you to make disclosures to the police if you believe in good faith that the disclosure is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious and imminent threat to the health or safety of a person or the public, you make that report to a person reasonably able to prevent or lessen the threat, such as the police, not necessarily calling up the local news station, and that that disclosure is consistent with applicable law and ethical conduct. So this is the exception that, for example, you have a patient that comes into the ER, they're high on Demerol, and they decide they don't want to be there anymore. And even though their judgment's impaired, they go out and get in their car, and you're afraid they're going to cause a serious accident, they're going to hurt themselves or somebody else, as long as you have that fear of serious and imminent threat to health or safety, it allows you to go ahead and contact law enforcement. You're okay. And the providers that presume to act in good faith in making that report, you're going to be protected so long as you had actual knowledge or credible or acted based on the representation by someone with apparent knowledge or authority. HIPAA also allows you to make disclosures if you believe in good faith that the disclosure is necessary for law enforcement to identify or apprehend an individual, but not just to capture them, it, has, it only applies if you satisfy these additional criteria. It, you have that belief based because of a statement by an individual admitting participation in a violent crime that the covered entity reasonably believes may have caused serious physical harm to the victim, so they admit that they are involved in a violent crime, or it appears that the individual has escaped from a correctional institution or from lawful custody. It, of course, always allows you to make disclosures to the extent that you get the patient's written authorization. So especially in uh, domestic abuse or rape cases, things like that, the police may want to come in and get some additional information. Remember, you may have an affirmative obligation to report certain information to the police under your state law. But what happens if they want more information than is covered by that particular state law? Well, one option is for the police or you to get the patient's written authorization that would allow you to make the additional disclosures. That HIPAA authorization has to satisfy certain criteria, all set forth in 45 CFR 164.508, including it's got to contain the elements that are listed up there on the screen. In fact, last week I sent out a client alert 
just uh, with a checklist of what is necessary for an effective authorization. If you didn't receive that and would like a copy of it, just shoot me a quick email and I'll make sure I get a copy of that to you. HIPAA also allows you to make certain disclosures for purposes of a facility directory. This isn't specific to police, it applies to anybody. If somebody shows up at your hospital, they go to your pink lady uh, who's sitting at the reception desk and they ask, is John Doe here? HIPAA would allow you to go ahead and make disclosures to that person subject to certain conditions. You can only disclose that information if you inform the patient that the provider would include their information in a facility directory and you gave the patient the chance to restrict the disclosures. For example, in your notice of privacy practices, you told them that it was your practice to make disclosures for use uh, for purposes of a facility directory unless they told you otherwise. And so you gave them an advance notice and the patient did not object. And so, um, you can make that disclosure if the patient does not want to be a do not publish or didn't manifest that they wanted to be a do not publish. If they objected and told you don't disclose the information, I want to be a do not publish, then this exception would not apply. If this exception potentially applies, it only applies if the person asks for the patient by name. So if they say that, you know, is Kim Stanger here or is this person there or is that person there, it would not apply if the police show up and say, have you received, or, or has somebody come in with a gunshot wound? Or has somebody come in with blonde hair and blue eyes who's six foot five? That, this exception would not apply. There may be other exceptions, but it wouldn't apply to this exception. If this exception does apply, you can only make limited disclosures. You can only disclose the patient's name, the patient's location in the facility, and the patient's general condition. Now, note that this does not require you to make the disclosure. It just says you may make the disclosure if the patient hasn't objected and you otherwise satisfy these criteria. This is the one that nor police officers normally rely on when they show up and want to know if a certain person is at the hospital. There's another exception that allows you to make disclosure to health oversight agencies for oversight activities authorized by the law. This is the exception that allows you to make disclosures to, for example, the OCR or the OIG or CMS or any of those other acronyms. HIPAA would allow you also to make a disclosure to law enforcement to the extent that that law enforcement shows up with a court order, warrant, subpoena, or summons that's issued by a judicial officer. By judicial officer, they mean a judge or a magistrate, not necessarily a prosecutor. A prosecutor is not a judicial officer. A prosecutor is law enforcement. So just because you get a subpoena signed by a prosecutor does not necessarily mean that you fit within this particular exception. On the other hand, if you get a subpoena, warrant, court order, or summons that's signed by the judge, and assuming that judge has jurisdiction in your area, then you can rely on that. The judge is the law. You can go ahead and make the disclosure. Just make sure you limit your disclosure to what is specifically said in that order. So if that order says produce this, this, and this, then just limit that disclosure to that information. Don't disclose other stuff. If that order says you disclose that information on a certain day, or you only turn over records, then, and it does not authorize you to have oral communications outside of that or disclose it to other persons, then you've got to limit your disclosure to the extent of that court order, warrant, or subpoena. HIPAA also allows you to make disclosures pursuant to a grand jury subpoena, and even if that grand jury subpoena is not signed by the judge. As we've all learned from the recent Ferguson case, what goes on in a grand jury is supposed to be confidential. And so HIPAA treats that with special protection. So as long as you get a subpoena in a grand jury case, and it'll say grand jury subpoena on it, you can go ahead and make the disclosure consistent with that subpoena. In addition, you can make disclosures for administrative requests, subpoenas, summons, or demands that are authorized by law. Now that doesn't mean that just because the prosecutor or the police ask for the information, that does not trigger this. We're talking about here like civil investigatory demands, civil subpoenas, administrative subpoenas, those types of things where the subpoena is authorized by law. The specific process is authorized by law. You can make that disclosure, but only if the person issuing the subpoena represents that the information is relevant and material to legitimate law enforcement inquiry, 
that the request is reasonably specific and limited to the purpose for that inquiry and the identified information was not enough, that they actually need protected health information. Then you can go ahead and make that disclosure. HIPAA also allows you to make disclosures in other civil proceedings. For example, again, if you get a court order and it's signed by the judge, you can go ahead and make the disclosure, make sure that you limit the disclosure to the extent of that order. In addition, you can make a disclosure pursuant to a subpoena discovery request or legal process that's not accompanied by a court order, but only if you satisfy certain criteria. Most of the subpoenas you get are not going to be signed by a judge. It's just signed by a local prosecutor, maybe signed by another attorney. In those situations, you can't just ignore it because it's still a valid subpoena, but neither can you produce the information because HIPAA says you can't produce it unless you satisfy certain criteria. So what you need to do when you get that subpoena, you need to make sure you need to determine whether or not you, that subpoena was accompanied by satisfactory written assurance that the party who issued the subpoena notified the patient and the patient had a chance to object. So there's some statement or letter confirming that for you. Or alternatively, and this is usually the easier situation, you can go ahead and notify the patient yourself and tell the patient, hey, I've got this subpoena. I'm going to have to comply with this unless you take steps to quash it by the, by the compliance date. If that patient fails to take steps, then you can go ahead and turn over the information pursuant to the subpoena. Both of these exceptions, both of these conditions, the key there is you've given notice to the patient so the patient can take appropriate steps to protect themselves. If they don't want to protect themselves, then that's kind of their business. But all you have to do is give them the notice so that they can take steps to protect themselves. If they fail to quash the subpoena or get it modified, then you can go ahead and turn over the records pursuant to the subpoena. Okay, next one. HIPAA would allow you to make disclosures to the law enforcement to, uh, to the extent necessary to identify or locate a suspect, fugitive, witness, or missing persons. But there's limitations on this. This is a situation where the police shows up and says, hey, we're looking for this type of a person, for this person who's a suspect or this person who's a victim. You can only provide the information in response to requests for law enforcement for that information. This does not allow you to simply call up the law enforcement if you think somebody has committed a crime, unless you can fit with some other exception. This just allows you to respond to a request from law enforcement. And in response to that request, you can only disclose certain limited information that's specified here on the slide, things like the name and address, date of birth, social security number, the date and time and treatment of death, and such, uh, such items. You can't turn over your entire file. You can't disclose more unless there's another exception or the police come back with a warrant or order or you get the authorization from the patient. Now, the commentary that goes along with HIPAA Note that this says that you can only respond to these types of situations. You can only make these disclosures if there's a request from law enforcement. The commentary states that uh, receiving some kind of a general media request or uh, wanted posters, if the police go out there and say, we're looking for this type of a suspect, you know, they're publishing that on the news, the commentary says that's sufficient. You can go ahead and respond to those situations if there is that type of request. Sometimes you get situations where the police show up and they, they just simply say um, they want you to notify any time you, for example, treat somebody who uh, was in a motor vehicle accident or maybe anybody who was bitten by a dog. Um, unless there's a state law that specifically requires you to do that, this exception does not allow that and you can't honor those requests. Sometimes you'll get a situation where the police know that the, the patient's in there at your facility and they say, hey, we don't want to arrest that person now because if we arrest them now, we're going to have to pay for their care because we assume their responsibility. So what we want you to do, we want you to tell us when you're going to release this person. Now, I have a concern about whether or not that fits with any, in, any HIPAA exception. I don't think that it reply, this particular exception applies because this particular exception only is used to identify or locate a suspect, fugitive, witness, or missing person. If the police know that that person's already there at your facility, then I don't think that this, that particular exception applies in this situation. 
Um, with that said, that's one that could probably be argued either way. Just be careful about it. Be sensitive to those situations. If the police are saying, hey, tell us when this particular patient leaves because I think that raises risks. Next, HIPAA would allow you to uh, disclose information if the law enforcement requests the information and they say that they need the, uh, the information to uh, get information about the victim of a crime. You can only disclose that information if the patient agrees to disclosure or that law enforcement official is unable to obtain the patient's agreement because of incapacity or emergency and the law enforcement officer represents that they need it immediately in order to take appropriate law enforcement activity. Now, uh, note that this might apply um, outside of that context, maybe in other states, but in Idaho, we have a particular state that requires you to make disclosures to law enforcement uh, if you're treating a victim of a crime anyway. So you probably wouldn't rely on this exception very much because you've got an affirmative obligation to report um, treatment to the victim of a crime, at least in Idaho. HIPAA also allows you to make disclosures if you think that the death has resulted from a crime. Uh, you may disclose information about the decedent to law enforcement for the purpose of alerting law enforcement to the death. Of course, here in Idaho, we have a separate statute that requires you to make uh, disclosures if you're providing treatment to the victim of a crime. Uh, maybe if you just got the body and you're not treating the victim of a crime, maybe that wouldn't apply, but this one would allow you to go ahead and make disclosures. HIPAA also allows you to make disclosures if you think that a crime has occurred on the premises. You may disclose the information that you believe in good faith constitutes evidence of a crime. But just because a criminal comes into the hospital, he can't uh, conduct a crime and then say you can't disclose it to the law enforcement. That doesn't work. So this may, for example, apply if maybe you have a patient come in here, come into your facility and steal a prescription pad or steal other items from you or commit a battery in your facility. This exception would allow you to go ahead and make those reports to law enforcement. Note the information that you can disclose. You can only disclose the information that you believe in good faith constitutes evidence of the crime, not necessarily all evidence concerning that particular patient. You can also report uh, a crime that occurs off the premises, away from the hospital. Um, in that situation, maybe you come across a wreck or somebody who's got a gunshot wound, you think that it's the victim of a crime, therefore you can go ahead and um, notify law enforcement. Now this exception would really only apply if you are gaining your information in your capacity as, provo as a healthcare provider. So if you're providing treatment away from the, away from the hospital, um, it would not apply if you simply happen to see a crime that's being committed, but you're not acting in your capacity as a healthcare provider. In that situation, HIPAA wouldn't apply. You're just simply a bystander or a witness, and you can go ahead and do what you want to in that situation. HIPAA, uh, there may be some situations where one of your employees believes that they're the victim of a crime. They want to go ahead and make the report. The question is, well, do you are you in violation of the of HIPAA if they do that? HIPAA says that you are not deemed to have violated if a member of your workforce who is a victim of a crime discloses information to law enforcement, but the information that they can disclose is theoretically limited. Um, so you'll want to train your employees, hopefully, to report um, a crime to you so that you can help them guide them through the steps of reporting to law enforcement. HIPAA allows you to make disclosures about information about prisoners or inmates who are in custody to law enforcement or correctional facility if that uh, correctional facility official or law enforcement official represents that they need the information in order to provide effective care for the person, for health and safety of the individual or other inmates, health and safety of officers or employees at a correctional facility, or health and safety of officers transporting a prisoner, or safety, security, and good order of the correctional institution. The bottom line here is although prisoners do not lose all their rights, they lose some of their rights, and you can go ahead and make disclosures for these purposes. Note that that only applies while the person is actually a prisoner. Once that prisoner is released and no longer in custody, then this exception would no longer apply, and you'd need another exception to make disclosures. Uh, what about if you've got a situation where an employee is a whistleblower? They want to narc on you or somebody else. Are you liable for their HIPAA violation? 
HIPAA says the provider is not deemed to have violated HIPAA if its workforce member discloses information in good faith that uh, the providers violated the law or endangered others, or the disclosure is and the disclosures to a healthcare oversight agency or law enforcement authorized by law to investigate and respond. Hopefully that never occurs in your organization. HIPAA also allows you to make disclosures for certain other public health activities. Those are things like surveys or disclosures of communicable diseases. All right, so those are generally the exceptions under HIPAA that will allow you to make disclosures to law enforcement. So if the police show up, they want information, or you may want to disclose information to police, you're wondering whether you can do that. You have to crack the books. You have to look at those that analysis and figure out, okay, does this disclosure fit within one of the exceptions? Now, periodically, you may have a situation where the police bring in a person and they say, hey, we want you to go ahead and provide treatment for this particular patient. It might be a drug test or a DUI test, or they might want to get medical clearance before they take them down to the jail or whatever. The general rule is that just because a person is in police custody does not mean that they no longer have rights to consent to or refuse their own health care. The patient generally has the right to consent to or refuse their treatment. If the patient's incompetent, under Idaho law, at least, you would need to get consent from an authorized surrogate decision maker, for example, the legal guardian, the spouse, parent, or other appropriate relative. Um, it's possible but that the police may be able to give effective consent, but only, they're at the bottom of the list, only if there are other people who are higher in that hierarchy are not available to give appropriate consent. If it's an emergency situation and the patient's incompetent, you may go ahead and provide emergency care necessary to protect the patient, but once the emergency's ended, that authorization would end. The bottom line here is just because the police bring that patient in does not first, does not mean that that patient's lost their rights to consent to a refused treatment, or second, that the police have the authority to order or uh, consent to care on behalf of that patient. You generally need to get the consent from the patient or the authorized decision maker and the general rule is, absent some statute that requires or allows otherwise, you shouldn't provide the treatment, even though it's requested by the police officer, if the patient's going to refuse. Now, of course, EMTALA applies. If the police officer brings in a patient, then EMTALA is going to be triggered. If you're a hospital that participates in Medicare, that means that you've got to provide the appropriate screening exam, and if the screening exam reveals a potentially emergency medical condition, then you've got to provide stabilizing treatment or an appropriate transfer. But even EMTALA is subject to the patient's consent. If the competent patient refuses treatment, then you've got to honor that. You just want to document that you offered that treatment and the patient refused. There are certain laws in some states that may authorize a provider to undertake a test or exam or treatment even if the patient does not consent. So it says, hey, even though the patient doesn't consent, you can go ahead and do this treatment. Now, in most of those situations, the law does not require you to do it. It just allows you to do it. And it would be a very rare case that you would want to provide treatment or conduct a test without the patient's consent, especially if it's going to involve any kind of invasive procedure or that could jeopardize the patient or the health or safety of those around them. In Idaho, here are some of the laws that allow you to go ahead and provide care without the patient's consent. The first is 24-hour mental hold. As you know, uh, that mental hold statute applies if the patient comes to the hospital and a peace officer or a physician or mid-level on the medical staff at the hospital has reason to believe the person is gravely disabled due to mental illness or the person's continued liberty poses an imminent danger to that person or others. If you can satisfy that criteria, you can impose a mental hold or the police officer can impose a mental hold and you can go ahead and hold that patient for up to 24 hours against their will while you get a designated uh, exam from a designated examiner. Now, sometimes you'll have the police that'll come in there and bring in the patient and say, we want you to put them on a medical hold. There is no such thing, at least under Idaho, as a medical hold. You can't treat a patient, a, a competent patient against their will unless there's another statute that allows you to do it. And there's very few in Idaho that allow you to do it. So if police come in, they say, we want you to put them on a medical hold. Say, hey, I'm sorry, there is no such thing as a medical hold in Idaho. You would need to get the patient's consent or if the patient's incompetent, the uh, 
consent from an authorized surrogate decision maker. Uh, there are Idaho statutes which state that uh, when you get a driver's license, you are consenting to DUI tests. So um, a healthcare provider can rely on that consent to go ahead and provide the DUI test. Now note that the way this statute works is that uh, the patient can withdraw their consent later. Now if you wanted to, you could go ahead and still provide the, the, the test, do the test, even though the patient refuses, but you're not required to. And my advice would be, look, you never want to fight with a patient over whether or not they're going to give you that kind of a test, especially if it's a blood test. Now, maybe if all you're doing is getting a urinalysis and you've got it there, you don't particularly care, but if it's going to be involved any kind of invasive action, you don't want to do that over the patient's objection. So my general rule is, no, you would refuse to go ahead and provide that. Now, hot breaking news, just off the wire. Last night I was sitting home watching the news, and lo and behold, they announced an Idaho Supreme Court case which said that essentially police could not rely on this statute to um, get drug tests without a warrant. So um, the statute is not necessarily going to be nullified, but the practical effect is the police are not going to be able to rely on this statute or rely on drug tests that are obtained without the patient's consent pursuant to this statute unless they get a warrant. Therefore, uh, you're probably going to see a lot fewer cases come in where the police ask you to do the drug test without the patient's consent or without a warrant. Uh, more information will be coming down on that, but that is late breaking news. Now that follows a Supreme Court case called Missouri v. McNeely out of, uh, from 2013, where the United States Supreme Court held that. So for you who are outside Idaho, you probably have similar situations in your state. Um, Idaho does also allow healthcare providers to provide certain tests of persons charged with certain offenses. Uh, usually involving sexually transmitted diseases or communicable diseases. So if the police bring somebody in, want that kind of a test, you can. The statute allows you to go ahead and conduct that test. But again, my general rule is this does not require you to do so, and I wouldn't do it if you're going to get in any kind of a fight with the patient. Only do it if you've got the patient's consent, especially if it's invasive care. Uh, similarly, there's another statute that allows you to provide testing for inmates, again, as long as the patient consents, that's great. If the patient doesn't consent, you could still probably do non-invasive stuff. But I would not ever get in a situation where you're poking a patient uh, with a needle when that patient doesn't want to be poked. There are Idaho statutes, there is an Idaho statute, that in limited circumstances will allow the police to order you to conduct a test. That only applies if the police order a blood draw for DUI testing and the officer has probable cause to suspect that there's aggravated DUI or vehicular manslaughter. The statute has specific requirements for that, who can do that, how it's done, but given the fact that we have these new Supreme Court cases stating that uh, blood draws without the patient's consent and without a warrant are not going to be enforceable, I really think you're not going to see many of these coming down the pipe. The bottom line is if you do get a police officer who's ordering you to conduct that test, you're generally required to do that, but you can refuse if you determine that the draw would result in serious injury to hospital personnel or other patients, or the draw is contraindicated by medical condition of, of the suspect or other patients. If you think that there's any concern about that, then you can tell the police officer, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that without the patient's consent. There are limited circumstances where the court may order or issue a warrant compelling an examination or testing. If you do that, hey, that's the law. That's the court ordering you to do something. You generally have to do that. Just make sure that you limit your actions to the scope of that order or warrant. If you disagree with that because you think that the test is contraindicated for the patient, or maybe you think that it's going to jeopardize uh, healthcare providers or operations or other patients, you can always go ahead and uh, uh, file a motion to quash and see if you can get the judge to, to modify that. All right, so those are situations where the police may come in and want you to conduct certain tests or certain treatment. What about if the police come in and they say, hey, we want to go in and arrest this person, or we want to access this particular patient so that we can talk to them about what's taking place. What do you do in that situation? Well, the key here is you want to be sensitive to the patient's privacy interests, but on the other hand, you do not want to physically interfere 
or hinder the police officer's activities. You don't want to end up like this particular nurse. This was out of Louisiana. The police apparently found out that a, a victim of abuse was in the, the facility. Um, they showed up, they wanted to interview that, that victim, and there was a nurse who um, decided to get in the way of the police and refused to allow them to interview that particular person because she said that that would violate the person's confidentiality rights. The police ended up arresting that particular nurse. That nurse ended up suing the police, and the judge in that case said no, the, the nurse did obstruct justice because HIPAA would allow that type of a disclosure. Uh, the bottom line is you don't want to physically uh, interfere with what the police are doing. If you do, then you run the risk of obstruction of justice. So what do you do? Well, here's the general rules. If you are a private health care provider or private hospital or the like, you generally can require the police to come back with a warrant. Remember, we've got the Fourth Amendment that says it generally protects against warrantless searches or seizures. If they come back with a warrant, you always have to comply with the terms of the warrant or try to take appropriate steps to get the warrant mod modified. Now, police may be able to access certain public areas without a warrant, but that's kind of a gray area. Uh, if you've got questions about that, you may want to consult your local attorney. If the police want to come in, you may want to explain to the police that like other members of the public, the police are not given unrestricted access to patient care areas and try to work out the situation with the police. The key there is to try to cooperate with the police. Most of the time, in my experience, the police officers are willing to cooperate with you. If you can explain to them the, the patient care risks or the operational uh, concerns, they're willing to work with you to try to come up with some kind of a solution. Now, if the police want access to the patient or facility, Ask yourself, is access appropriate considering your patient care concerns, your operations, and even the patient wishes? It may be appropriate if the police want access to go in and ask the, the patient, hey, the police want to talk to you, is that okay with you? If the patient agrees then, and you don't otherwise think it's interfering with patient care or your operations, then fine, go ahead and allow the police to access. If the patient declines, you may want to explain that to the police and object to, to the police's involvement and uh, ask them if they can come back at a later time or make alternative solutions. Um, before you talk to the patient, though, I thought I ought to mention this. Before you talk to that patient, you may want to discuss it with the police because if you talk to the, poli uh, the patient before talking with the police and that patient runs or flees or something like that, or, or maybe that it could create a, a scene with that patient, you may want to consult with the police just to make sure that the police do not want to do this in confidence or they don't think that, um, that this patient poses a significant risk. Now, if you go back to the police, you explain the objections, the concerns, and the police insist on access despite your objections, don't obstruct the police. Remember, the police have guns, the police have authority, they can arrest you. You want to lodge your objections, but don't physically obstruct them. Don't lie to them. Don't tell them the patient's not there if the patient really is there. Don't make misrepresentations of facts. You want to document your objection, including the parties involved in the circumstances. If that police wants to go in and you've asserted your objections, then you say, okay, officer, then you know, obviously we won't interfere. However, you know, let me get your name and your badge number because I'm gonna be calling your supervisor because what you're doing is completely inappropriate. Um, you may then want to go ahead and follow up with the police officer's supervisor to explain the situation um, and then follow up afterwards and try to work with the police to develop a protocol for avoiding these types of situations in the future. My, in my experience, the police are really willing to cooperate with you. The best defense here is a good offense, so you work out these protocols in advance. All right, so in closing here, the last few minutes, let's talk about applying some of these rules in your situation. The main key is keep fall, calm and follow the rules. The general rule is, if you have concerns or questions about whether information can be disclosed to law enforcement, explain it to the law enforcement. Voice and document any objections that you may have and or ask for authority from the law enforcement. There's nothing wrong with you saying, hey, we think HIPAA prevents us from doing this, 
Uh, have you got some kind of authority? Do you have a warrant? Do you have, is there some kind of a statute that allows you to get this information or that requires us to disclose? We want to cooperate with you, but, you know, we're bound by HIPAA and we've got all these penalties that are going to rain down upon our head if we act improperly. Can you just tell us, you know, what the authority is? What is it that gives you the authority to get this information and then consider it? Never physically obstruct, misrepresent facts, or affirmatively hinder law enforcement efforts. It's, it's one thing to maybe decline to disclose information. It's another thing to affirmatively get in their way and prevent them from doing what they feel like they need to do. If you do the latter, you may be liable for obstruction of justice. When in doubt, you may want to contact your attorney. Hopefully they understand HIPAA and the rules that we're talking about today. Uh, as I mentioned, the best defense is a good offense. You ought to prepare in advance to address these situations and not wait till the police actually show up. That means you'll want to include disclosures to law enforcement in a notice of privacy practices so your people, your patients understand that you may have to make disclosures to law enforcement and avoid the argument that um, you're making disclosures contrary to law enforcement. You should establish a policy or process for responding when law enforcement show up or call, including identify the person who's responsible for contact contacting or responding to law enforcement, whether that's a charge nurse, an administrator on call, or a privacy officer. Ensure the privacy officer understands the applicable rules. Instruct personnel to notify the responsible person as soon as possible if the police show up. You should then work with the uh, work out that process in advance with the law enforcement. I had good luck sitting down with, uh, for example, the hospital representative and the local prosecutor and or law, uh, law enforcement officials and saying, okay, when you show up, these are the concerns that we've got. These are the HIPAA requirements. What can we do in order to come up with a protocol that's going to address your concerns but also allow us to protect our patients? Remember, you are not police officers. You are not agents of the police officers. Your primary obligation is to protect your patients. Along with that, you've got an affirmative obligation to protect the confidentiality of the patient information. You can only make disclosures to the extent that it's allowed and consistent by HIPAA or required by some other law. And therefore, just explain that to the police and come up with protocols for addressing these situations in the future. That might be that if the physician wants to show, or the police officer wants to show up and issue a subpoena or comes with a warrant or wants to arrest somebody, that they contact the risk manager in advance and you will work with the police officer to make sure that those situations are addressed appropriately. You need to train your personnel concerning the process, including what their obligations are and the limits on disclosures and the process for making disclosures, whether they run all of that through your privacy officer or somebody else. Before disclosing protected health information, HIPAA requires that you verify the identity of the person seeking that. So if a police officer shows up, represents that they're a police officer, then you need to take reasonable steps, if you don't know them, to verify that they really have that authority. Things like, you know, asking to see their badge, asking to see the warrant. If they're there uh, seeking information about a victim or a suspect, you've got to make sure that they give you the required request, that they request that they need that information to locate or, or track down a suspect. <clears throat> um, Remember that to be valid, a court or, or administrative tribunal generally has to have jurisdiction over the entity to whom the order, warrant, or subpoena is issued. So if they come in with a warrant and it's an uh, Oregon, Oregon warrant issued by a court over in Oregon and you don't happen to be in Oregon, you're over here in Idaho, that warrant generally has no authority here. The officer has to have uh, authority in the jurisdiction in which they're, they're seeking that. If you have any questions about whether they've got the appropriate authority, you can ask the officer and follow up with your own attorney if there's any doubt. In most cases, you're not required to respond to a law enforcement request absent a warrant, subpoena, or court order. That's the constitutional protection. HIPAA generally allow you to make disclosures, but they don't require you to make disclosures. So if the police show up and they want information about a patient or a victim, HIPAA would, in certain circumstances, allow you to make the disclosure, but they do not require you to make the disclosure. If they come with a warrant, then you're required to make the disclosure, but only to the extent the disclosure is required. But be careful. Usually you want to cooperate with law enforcement. Now state laws, like we talked about, may require certain disclosures. So even though HIPAA doesn't require it, certain state laws may, so you want to make sure you act consistently with that. And again, Never physically interfere, lie to, or affirmatively hinder law enforcement if they proceed over your objection. 
Generally, you don't need to respond to informal law enforcement requests. If they're asking for the information informally, just ask for the basis or authority for the request and explain to them, hey, we've got HIPAA limits. And ask yourself, you know, is there an exception under HIPAA that allows us to go ahead and make the disclosure? Um, if there are, if uh, you have objections to making the disclosure, make sure you explain the HIPAA requirements to the officer. You may want to ask to speak with the officer's supervisor. You may want to contact your own attorney, and if they still insist, make sure you document the objections and police actions, including names and badge numbers. But again, it's not clear enough yet. Never physically interfere or affirmatively hinder law enforcement if they insist on acting despite your objection. Now, even if HIPAA allows you to make the disclosure, the minimum necessary rule says you can only disclose the amount that is minimally necessary. So if a law requires you to make the disclosure, only disclose the amount that's required by the law. If HIPAA allows you to make the disclosure, only uh, make the disclosure to the extent allowed by HIPAA. If you've got a warrant or subpoena, only disclose the information uh, consistent with the scope of that subpoena or warrant. When you make the disclosure to the police, you're going to have to log that disclosure because that's the type of stuff that has to be logged in so that if the patient comes back and wants an accounting of disclosures you've made, that you've got that log that you can give them. So you're going to have to log the date of the disclosure, the name and address of the entity receiving the information, and so forth. If there is an improper disclosure of information, you may have an affirmative obligation to report that disclosure to the individual and to the government. You must report a breach of unsecured protected health information, but only if it violates the law. So not every disclosure to the police has to be reported to the individual. Instead, you only have to report it if that violation, if the disclosure is in violation of the law. So maybe your people disclosed information contrary to the rules we've talked about today, or the police insist on taking action um, over your objections. Generally, you have to report within 60 days uh, to the individual, to the government. The timing depends upon the number of persons affected. Uh, the report, uh, the unauthorized access user disclosure of unsecured protected health information is presumed to be a reportable breach unless you can demonstrate that there's a low probability that the data has been compromised based on the analysis of those four factors in your data breach policies. In certain circumstances, law enforcement may ask you to not make that report. They can suspend your report to the individual for a certain period of time if, for example, they tell you that they don't want you to make the report because it would clue in the individual to an investigation. If the statement's in writing, you may delay the report for the time period stated in that writing from the law enforcement official. If the law enforcement just asks you orally, you may delay the report to the individual for up to 30 days. After those 30-day period, you would be required to make the report, but presumably within that 30-day period, if the police need more time, you would go back to the police and ask them to give you a written statement, and then you could rely on that written statement. Uh, remember, HIPAA applies to your business associates. You just need to make sure your business associates are also complying with these rules. For those of you who are business associates, you also have to comply with this stuff because now you're directly subject to HIPAA. Um, for you whose business associates may screw up, the general rule is you're not liable for what your business associate does unless they are acting as your agent or you knew that they were messing up and you didn't take affirmative steps to correct it. We've talked today about HIPAA. There may be other state laws that could apply or federal laws including things like attorney-client privilege, the work product doctrine, the period of privilege, uh, certain protections that apply to drug and alcohol treatment records. They may provide more restrictive uh, limitations on disclosures to law enforcement. If it's a potential that those other laws apply, make sure you're aware of them. Also, make sure you consult with your own attorney upon their application to a given circumstance. All right, that is it. That is a quick summary of uh, responding to law enforcement requests and interacting with law enforcement. If you want additional resources, uh, there's some resources up there on the screen, including the AMA's guidelines for releasing patient information to law enforcement. That's available on the Internet. Or if you did not get these other written materials, send me a quick email and we'll make sure that we get those to you. Uh, the government maintains very helpful websites, especially the HIPAA website that has a bunch of FAQs and those guides dealing with law enforcement. You can access it there. Um, if you have any questions, you can use that chat feature, send them to me, or just send me an email offline. Also, a quick plug, uh, again, if any of you would like to receive our health law updates, uh, just send me a quick email. We'll add you to the email list. 
Uh, also, we are continuing our webinar series into the next year. Uh, we're working on coming up with our schedule. If any of you have particular topics that you would like us to address in webinars, shoot me a quick email. We'll see if we can work those into the schedule. In January, we're going to be talking about fraud and abuse laws, particularly Stark, the anti-kickback statute, civil monetary penalties, and what you need to do if you discover you violated that and need to make a repayment. That is it. Thank you all very much. If we don't speak before, I hope you all have very great holiday seasons, and we appreciate your participation and support.